and we're recording. Hi, friends. We'll get started in just a moment. We'll let everybody file in before we get started with tonight's stamp chat. Really, really excited. I got a brief preview. So I can't wait for the presentation either, just like you all. And we have a chat already. Let's see what's up. Oh, it's always nice to see friends on the line, fellow philatelists from around the world, especially the uh, social media world. Thank you for joining us tonight. And as we are ones for semi-promptness, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name's Heidi, I'm with the American Philatelic Society. Today on Stamp Chat, we welcome Ms. Jasmine Smith. Ms. Smith is a librarian and postal collectible restorer. She has a professional archives and special collections experience. Jasmine is interested in helping postal historians preserve their physical collections and share their research with wider audiences through digital tools. And as an aside, we had uh, Ms. Smith and Mr. Bill Schultz on, um, on a stamp chat a few months ago on the six and a quarter piece and I wanted to congratulate them as they their website has just received the Large Vermeil Award from the Chicago Pex Literature Competition. So here's to both of you for your extraordinary work in philatelic research. Today's stamp chat is sponsored by the APRL. When you become a member of the APS, you're able to enjoy an access to the world's largest philatelic uh, collection of global philatelic literature. Nearly three miles of shelf space and an extensive digital library of material make the American Philatelic Research Library the most comprehensive resource for philatelic content. It's easy to become a member. Just go to stamps.org backslash join now and you'll start receiving those member benefits today. Now, all right, uh, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and get started. We have a few housekeeping items. This is a webinar and as such, your cameras and mics are turned off respectively throughout the presentation. I do encourage you to use the chat box if you want to share random thoughts or engage with other attendees, not a problem. If you do have a question for Ms. Smith, which I am sure you will, please use the Q&A box for those uh, comments and your questions. We really appreciate that. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the APS YouTube channel where you can subscribe and be notified of new stamp chats that are available. And with that, we present Think Like an Archivist, Preserving Postal History Collections at Home. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen tonight and I have a presentation, but I'm also going to be hopping in and out of that to show you a number of resources, a couple of in-person visual aids. So bear with me as I uh, bring slides up and down over the course of the talk tonight. I think it will be worth it for the information that I'm going to be sharing. So hopefully, Everyone can see my screen. I am Jasmine Smith. I am a librarian and archivist. I have a master's in library science along with a graduate certificate in archives and preservation. I've worked in an archival setting um, and as well as a number of academic libraries uh, managing archives in those libraries as well. So what I'm going to share with you tonight is information about thinking like an archivist. So how would an archivist take care of postal materials, most of which is going to be paper, in a home environment? So I realize that obviously when we're collecting postal materials, we don't necessarily have a specially built archival storage space in which to house those, but there's a lot of practical measures that you can take at home in order to keep your material in the best possible condition and do what's called preventative conservation, which means we're not doing any treatments to materials, but the way that we take care of it, handle it and store it and exhibit it 
leads to it lasting as long as possible and helps prevent deterioration over time. So there are a number of common environmental threats that your material might face in the storage environment in which you have it. First one I'm going to talk about is light. So this shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone. Uh, as you'll know from having things on the walls of your home um, or you know, something hanging outside, the longer it's in the sun, the more it's going to fade. Well, sunlight, of course, has UV elements to it. That's high energy light and it causes chemical reactions to happen. It excites atoms. And so when you leave your postal material out in the sunlight, you're going to see fading. You're going to see it getting probably browner and more brittle. Uh, the same can be true to an extent for electric light. So that's not nearly as usually as high energy light as, as sunlight, but that doesn't mean that we want to leave collectible material, paper material, out in the light for long periods of time because that light exposure will accumulate over time and lead to deterioration and fading. Then we have the hair, and these two really go together, and that's temperature and humidity. And of course, again, if you know your chemistry, um, temperature and humidity are closely related to one another. Ideally, the humidity in the place where your postal materials live would be below 50%. Now, depending on where in the country you live, if you're out in Arizona where I used to live, you're rarely going to have a day when the humidity is going to exceed that. Uh, if you live here in Pennsylvania where I am now, um, you might not have very many days where it dips below. So, uh, where you live and the conditions there really are going to influence both humidity and temperature. With temperature, it's great to have the materials at or below 70 degrees. Now, a lower humidity feels pretty nice for people, but a temperature at 60 degrees uh, isn't so great for us. So, when you're thinking about those, think of them together. Uh, you probably don't want to be in a house that's 60 degrees, so you might want it to be closer to 70 degrees. In that case, keep an eye on your humidity. Is it 70 degrees inside and also 80% humidity? Well, that's getting fairly warm and damp, and that's the kind of conditions where you might have what is happening over here on the right with some mold growth. And that is something that we really want to avoid. Mold is difficult to treat in a long-term and effective way. You can sort of reduce mold buildup, but actually killing the mold, you know, permanently uh, taking care of it uh, often involves some pretty intense treatment that you would have to go to really a specialized place in order to get. Now, on the flip side, when materials get super dry, uh, just like you, they're gonna get kind of brittle and flaky and not feel so great either. So we don't necessarily want to sit stuff right in front of a dehumidifier and um, dry it out. It might start to get crack and brittle. So we, we wanna go for a sort of a balance. Uh, if you have a pretty humid home, if you live in a humid climate, then a dehumidifier in the room where your postal materials live might be a good idea. But keep track of your environment and your conditions. It's easy to get a combination thermometer, hygrometer that will let you kind of keep an eye on how damp and how hot is my house and think about um, whether there are things that you can do to help manage that temperature. We also have pollution, and pollution can build up on paper materials and, again, contribute to degradation over time. Now, you may think, okay, I live in the country, there aren't a lot of cars driving around, I don't really need to worry about pollution, but let me ask you a couple of questions. 
Do you or does anyone in your house smoke? Do you or someone in your house like to use an oil diffuser or burn lots of scented candles or just candles in general? Does your city apartment have a not too great HVAC system? Or do you have lots of open windows and pollen and maybe even mold spores blowing through a lot of the summer? All of these could contribute to pollution buildup on your paper materials. So those are all things to think about. I think that the candles or the oil diffusers are factors for environmental pollution that most people might not immediately think about. So something to be aware of if you really like your house to smell a certain way. Of course, we have poor storage locations. So do your materials live in an attic or a basement? Attics and basements, there's a reason that we people don't usually live in those. And that's because they tend to not be very comfortable. Either they're very cold or very hot. A lot of times in either case, they can be somewhat damp. You might have problems with water intrusion in a basement and flooding is a huge threat to collections. So if you do keep your materials in a basement, you would probably in that case really want to look into something like a dehumidifier and you want to make sure that they are stored in shelving or cases or however you keep them that is not directly on the floor so that if water does get into your basement, they have a little bit of leverage to be kept out of it and be kept safe. Um, and we have a question here. If, it, if you haven't been protecting your materials for years, is it too late to start? Um, and the answer to that is not at all. So if you see things in this presentation tonight and you think, oh no, I've, I've been doing something that I'm not feeling is a good right now, it's not too late to make the change. And I will point out that if you, let's say, collect stampless covers from the 1820s, they have made it this far. Um, they're probably pretty delicate at this point, but they've been around, obviously, through at least 100 years of, of not having any sort of climate control indoors, aside from a fireplace or maybe a coal burning stove. So just because um, they haven't been in ideal conditions with you, they've probably had some of the best store storage conditions of their lengthy paper lives uh, with a modern collector in our fairly climate controlled houses with pretty good insulation and, you know, at least in the floors where people live, usually pretty good uh, water tightness, so they're not getting wet. So it's never too late to start, and hopefully at the end I can answer some practical or specific questions that people have about storage. Another thing to be aware of is insects and pests. So again, this is particularly a risk, I would say, in attics and basements especially if you don't go down or up there frequently. There may be you know, insects that build up for days before you notice. Whereas if things are stored in the people floors of your house, you're more likely to notice that more quickly. And typically we don't have as many insects or pests getting into the places that we live. Um, be careful of not just insects, but also mice and rodents will chew, you know, anything they can get their little teeth on, including your postal collections. So these are all common environmental threats that as archivists, we are really aware of and design storage spaces in order to uh, maximize the protection or the temperature and humidity control. Like I said, we can't necessarily have that same level of intentional control in our houses, but there's a lot that we can translate from the archive into the home just by being aware of these factors. So then we have 
threats to materials from handling and organizing. So handling as we're managing, you know, taking things in and out of storage areas or mounting them or opening them up to look at them, we might have cracked or torn fold lines. Again, cracking might be especially a risk if the material is overly dried out or overly hot and dry, that will start to make it brittle. Um, but sometimes those fold lines, you know, whoever originally had the material may have read this letter a lot of times and those fold lines are just really weak. Um, so that's just something to be aware of as you're handling materials is to be gentle. Then we have um, tape and also post-its. And I think most people are pretty aware, have seen instances of tape being a problem. Uh, over time, you have the adhesive layer and then you have the usually plastic upper layer with pressure sensitive tape and those two layers can start to separate. So sometimes the adhesive dries out, gets really dark brown and the surface layer basically disconnects. Uh, other times the adhesive layer gets very gummy and sticky and then the surface layer is just really glued on there. So I know that in many cases you have obtained these materials with tape already on them, but as current collectors, we can do our best to not add more tape. So if you like to put tape on things, and the only thing that you hear from me tonight is stop putting tape on things, then I have been successful and we have had a good night. Post-its, I realize as well, are also great for organizing, but I'm gonna do my first hop around here. This is, and I hope everyone can see it, an article from the Smithsonian Archives. This is from 2013 about post-its. This is basically the common knowledge best practices in the archival community, but I like to be able to support what I'm telling you. Um, the National Archives and Records Administration, NARA, actually did tests on post-its. And what they found was that sticky notes do leave behind residue. It's not tons of residue, but if we're talking about a really important philatelic item and you may have it for a long time and then other people in the future may have it over the next 50 or 100 years, those residues can start to darken or cause staining in the place where they are. There's a lot of things that can happen over time with residues. I have also had materials with post-its on them where the material was very, very fragile. The item itself was very fragile. And so the post-it, uh, just trying to take that post-it off, it, it was taking fibers with it. So of course, uh, if you have something that's really delicate, then absolutely don't put a post-it on the item. Um, that's why it's great to have, you know, mylar enclosures. You can stick post-its on these things all day long. If it gets post-it stuff on it, put a new one on there. You know, it is not a, a super irreplaceable historic artifact in and of itself. Uh, you can just go bananas with post-its on the enclosures, but you want to avoid putting them on the actual materials. Of course, as things are used, uh, they may get stained. A lot of things probably have been stained prior by, by prior owners and, and maybe collectors. Um, stains can come in the form of water stains or they can be other water-based stains. So you might have tea or something on it. And then you can also have more oil-based stains and the methods for trying to um, ameliorate those two types of stains are different and involve different processes, but stains are difficult to remove. So you wanna to try to avoid stains if at all possible. I always make sure that my postal working area uh, is a food and drink free area. I never have water there. I never eat there. 
Um, it is totally separate from any sort of stain producing activities. You might have exhibiting remnants. So I've definitely received some materials. There's a picture of one here where somebody had stuck this on a sort of card in order to exhibit it with two strips of double-sided tape. Uh, luckily, that double-sided tape was slowly and gently able to be removed from the item, but that adhesive layer of the tape had leached a certain amount of um, oils into the cover. So before I sent this cover back, I actually put a, just a archival plastic sheet inside of it to prevent that contaminant from leaching through to the front side. And over time, it was very hard to see those lines now because it was not super old tape. But if we looked at this item again in 50 years, especially if it's been stored in a humid or hot type of climate, I expect those two lines to have darkened. So I really wanted to make sure that the, that didn't leach through to the front side of it and leave two big dark lines across the front. So those exhibit remnants can really threaten the, the longevity of the material. And then uh, you'll hear about this a lot if you talk to archivists, metal fasteners and rubber bands. So I'm sure everybody has seen an old crusty rubber band that's like all stuck to stuff and kind of falling apart. So I don't think I need to go into too much discussion over why we don't want to use rubber bands. Metal fasteners, especially in, if you're in more of the Pennsylvania climate, they do rust over time. And you don't really want to get rust stains uh, on the surface of your materials. So I always stay away from metal fasteners. Other ways to group things together would be to put them all in the same folder or into the same little enclosure, you know, using uh, containers rather than things that actually grab on would be preferable. And that's how we would handle this in an archival setting. So how would an archivist store and handle collections? Well, if you've ever been in an archive, you've probably seen shelves and shelves and shelves of gray boxes with metal edges or tan boxes. So I have, this is my favorite conference souvenir. It is a little tiny baby uh, archival box. So we call these, we usually refer to these as Hollinger boxes because one of the companies that makes them is the Hollinger company, but it just has a little lid that opens here. And then most of the materials are kept inside in little folders. So we group things together, um, by various categories, it depends on the collection. And then each folder will be labeled. Usually they'll be numbered. So this box might have folders one through 20 and each folder has specific contents. And both of these types of items are going to be acid free. So a lot of papers, especially if you're looking at papers made between say 18, 30 to 1850 and about 1980, they tend to have a high acid content in and of themselves based on how they were made and their materials. We definitely don't want our storage containers to contribute to that acidification because it is very destructive to the paper over time. So these acid-free boxes and acid-free folders serve a couple of functions. Uh, one, they help us keep everything organized and labeled, but two, they really help with our climate control. So if I have some items in my box here and it starts pouring outside, I might even be able to feel the air in the room getting more humid. But the box is going to help buffer the rate of change for the materials inside of it. It's not airtight. It's not going to keep it from ever getting humid inside the box. But what it does is it slows that transition down. And again, thinking about our physical sciences and chemistry, um, you know, as things get 
warmer or cooler or wetter or drier. There's expanding and contracting that happens. So if we can make that expanding and contracting happen more slowly, it is gentler on the materials. So having our little boxes here is like a little protective house for our postal materials. And with it being acid free, that means that it's not going to contribute to any degradation of the materials themselves. We also have, and, and many of you I know have many of these little archival sleeves. So we've got just a piece of archival plastic here. You might use mylar, you might use other brands, uh, polyethylene or polyester type plastics. We want the ones that aren't going to degrade over time. You've probably seen like an old sheet protector that gets um, all crispy and crinkly and kind of falls apart. These more archival plastics shouldn't do that and they shouldn't yellow. And the other thing we wanna consider is off gassing. So uh, if you put your materials, let's say in a, a plastic tub that you picked up from somewhere, you wanna make sure that tub doesn't have that plastic smell. Because if it has a plastic smell, that means it's releasing gases and those probably are not good for paper or any other collectible type material. Now, when we have our sleeves, uh, you wanna look for ones that hold the material, are sized appropriately for the material, hold it pretty well, but give enough size that you're not, um, Sometimes they're really tight fitting, and that can maybe be appealing for exhibiting purposes, but it does have some risk as you take things in and out of catching them on the edges. It also can, depending on conditions, if they're too tightly closed in plastic and they can't get any airflow, if it gets a little bit humid or damp in there, they're going to be kind of stuck in there with that moisture and you've made sort of your own little like biodome terrarium. So we want to try to avoid plastic sleeves that are too tight or too fitted just to eliminate risks of them catching on edges as they go in and out or getting stuck in there and getting a little bit humid. Uh, HVAC control. So in an archival storage space, we have monitors in multiple places that show the temperature and humidity at all times. Some archives, depending on how much money they have to work with, might have automated alert systems if things start getting out of acceptable range. There's special filtration systems put in and you know HVAC systems that are set up to really manage temperature and humidity. Now again, this isn't practical for your home in most cases. So when you're thinking about control in your own house, if you have AC, you know, and you're running it in the summer, that's great. Your material likes a cool environment. Uh, heat, you know, it's hard, hard for, it's hard for it to get too cold for materials. There are uh, photo archives that store materials at zero-ish temperatures inside of mountains. Um, we don't need to go quite that extreme. But you know, keep your house at a comfortable temperature in the winter. And as long as it's not getting too humid in there, your materials really should be fine. Um, you, you do wanna try to avoid like putting them in a shelf or a container, like let's say next to the radiator. You know, they're gonna be getting a lot of swings there. The radiator turns off, it cools down, it turns on, it gets really hot. Um, so they're gonna get that temperature roller coaster. So you wanna to try to place them somewhere that's going to be a little bit more stable. You know, as your heating system comes on and off, it will have a little bit of variation, but it's not directly under the vent or something along those lines. And then another question that I get fairly regularly is should I wear gloves? And this is a great question. A lot of movies love to show anybody who works in an archive or museum or library type setting wearing gloves because it says like this person is serious. Um, but in actuality, for archivists, 
Wearing gloves is not something that's usually recommended. So if you are working with photographs or if you collect postal material that incorporates photographs in some way, then yes, you should wear gloves because the oils from your fingers interact with photographic chemicals and can actually cause damage. But for regular paper, what we recommend is that before you handle it, you wash your hands. Clean hands uh, propose pretty minimal risk to paper objects. And the risk of wearing gloves is that people can't feel as well with the gloves on, and there can be an increased risk of them actually tearing or accidentally damaging something because they can't really feel and they might turn a page too hard or get caught on it. So um, in general, as an archivist, I only wear gloves if I'm working with photographic materials. So how would an archivist exhibit? Well, we would try to exhibit infrequently. So lots of archives might have a couple of items that they really like to show off that are particularly special to their archive. But we would try to not have those same items, back page, have those same items on display all the time because as they're on display, they're going to be accumulating that light exposure. It's not gonna be very good for them. Um, the way that they're mounted might put small amounts of stress on the item. So we would try to keep them in their boxes most of the time and then have them on display for specific periods of time um, and in specific controlled exhibit areas. So there would be uh, lighting controls. The lights might have UV filters over them to help protect the paper-based materials. And what we may do, let's say that the museum is having a year-long exhibit, it's possible that some of the paper artifacts in that exhibit would be swapped out once or maybe twice during the course of that exhibit to minimize their exposure or there are certain books on display at different repositories or archives, and they might turn the page on a semi-regular basis, again, to decrease the accumulated light exposure of that open page. Uh, we also have some tools that we might use. So on to my next tab. Archival photo corners. So that's like these little plastic and black edges that you can use to mount things. The keywords that I look for in this sort of listing. So we have archival safe, pressure sensitive corners. Um, they're made from inert archival polypropylene with a neutral pH neutral pH pressure sensitive adhesive. So I've got inert archival plastic and I've got neutral pH adhesive. And so those are two important elements that I would be looking for for any sort of mounting supplies that I was looking at purchasing. I'd want to stick those corners onto hopefully an acid-free mounting surface. So that might just mean that I try to make sure that the paper that I print my philatelic descriptions on is acid-free. Most of the paper you're going to get, if it's decent quality paper these days, is going to be acid-free. It'll usually say something on the packaging or in the listing that says it's acid-free, uh, but you don't really want to take your prized philatelic possessions and stick them up against a piece of acidic paper for a while. It's not going to help anything. Um, you can also look at custom enclosures. So I've got basically a little sort of envelope that I've made here out of archival plastic. And 
I'm going to stop my share. So I've got a little envelope here that I've made out of archival plastic. And basically what you could do with this sort of thing is slip your cover inside of the envelope, close it up. It's just sitting in there now, perfectly happy. And I can stick as much tape as I want onto this envelope and then just mount it and put it up. So that's a way, a custom sort of enclosure or just the regular enclosure that it lives in is a way to um, help take care of your materials. And I'm also, I'm not sure um, if you guys could see me off to the side before. This is my little archival box. So I realized I didn't stop the share at that point. Hopefully everyone maybe could see me in the little sidebar. But here's my little archival box. It's got a lid that lifts. And then I've got a little folder inside. So this is an acid-free folder and an acid-free box. And they would just get lined up in here. Like I said, I might have 15 or 20 folders in one box, each with their own topic. And then we would label those folders always, always in pencil. So part of that's practical. You can erase pencil, relabel a folder, and reuse it later on. Uh, usually in archives, we're trying to be as economical as possible with our supplies. But the other convenient thing about pencil is that it is not going to stain materials if it comes into contact with them. If it did get on something, it could actually be removed. Uh, it can't always say the same for pen inks. So whenever I'm working with documents or if you go to an archive to do research, they will probably tell you that you're only allowed to have pencils at the tables or in the archive. And that is because if you accidentally get a little bit of a pencil mark on something, we can fix that pretty easily. If you accidentally get a pen mark on something, that is a whole different kettle of fish. So we like to stay away from that pencil when possible. So lastly, I'm gonna mention carefully chosen venues. So when you are choosing an exhibiting venue, ideally it would have limited sunlight in the exhibiting space so that your materials aren't sitting there in a beam of sun all day. Um, and it would also hopefully be relatively climate controlled. And for example, if you're affiliated with a show that's connected to the APRL, probably the, the exhibiting space is carefully chosen and going to be good for having your materials there for a couple of days. Um, but if you are maybe putting up a single frame at your local philatelic club, uh, try to think about like, is this frame sitting in a spot where it's gonna get afternoon sunlight every day? Uh, should we move it somewhere that it's not right in the, the sunbeam from the window? So just things to think about as you're setting up a small scale exhibit somewhere. So how do you find supplies? Well, there are a couple of websites that uh, archivists typically go to for this type of material. So first we have Hollinger Metal Edge. Hollinger tends to have, you can see right here, document cases which show which look just like what I've been showing you. They will also have plenty of folders, photo corners, all of that sort of material. Gaylord Archival is another popular archival retailer. Again, they will have most of this storage type material. It doesn't really matter that much if you get the gray or the tan versions of things. Um, there can sometimes be slight differences between them. Usually the gray boxes, they're pretty standard, will be fine. Uh, sometimes the tan is more for like photographs. But if you 
hate gray and like tan, you know, go for tan, it's fine. Um, and then finally, I have here Brodart, and Brodart also has archival supplies. So you can go to archival document preservation and take a look at the types of supplies that they have available. Uh, so resources. There are resources out there that can help tell you more. So again, we're going to pop back out of the presentation. And I think one of the best resources for this type of information is from the Northeast Document Conform Conservation Center. They have a whole series of little uh, pamphlets, preservation leaflets, as well as other sort of introductory basic tools that can really help you answer some questions, get some information. If you wanted to look up, oh, um, you know, what kind of environment am I supposed to have? They have a whole little leaflet here on temperature and humidity and light and air quality. Um, so there's lots of reading and resources here. This is far more extensive than I would expect most people to want to go through in its entirety. But as far as something to refer to, if you maybe have a question, it's a great resource. And then museums, archives may have blogs or websites that are useful. So this is from the National Archives and it's a great resource. It is um, intended to help people preserving things like family materials, Again, a lot of the same principles are going to apply to philatelic materials. So things like, what do you want to preserve? And you can go, oh, I would like to preserve paper and parchment. And then it links you to a variety of information on that subject. Um, talks a little bit about archival formats. You've got a lot to work with here. We hop back a page. Uh, you can see there's information again here on things like storage and handling. So this information is out there for anyone to read and get a sense of. Um, and you can spend time looking at those if you are interested in doing so. And then who can help you? So archivists and museum professionals all should have a pretty good foundation in the basics of preventative conservation and how materials on paper should be stored in a day-to-day -day basis. And then of course there's restorers and conservators. So there are conservation labs. A full lab is going to have access to things like fume hoods and lots of chemicals and they can perform all sorts of really high, high touch, high need sort of treatments for your materials. And then there's independent restorers. So that's really more where I would fall in. Uh, if, if something had a tear in it, an independent restorer could pretty easily repair that for you. Um, but you know, what I don't have in my dining room is a washing table and a fume hood and a safe chemical station. So there's definitely a different level of services that you're going to see from different types of people who can help you um, restore or conserve your materials. And with that, we're gonna to go to questions. So I'm actually going to stop sharing. And I can see there's a number of questions in the Q&A and the chat. And you want me to read those out loud? Yeah, story, well, I've got the, the Q&A here. Goody. So uh, I'm going to kind of go through and, and try to pick some different questions and talk about them a little bit. Um, so first question is about stamp entropy. Um, and yes, so over time, I think any material is going to degrade somewhat. Um, 
you know, there's, there's not a magic bubble that we can put materials in that will prevent all degradation from happening. But storing things well and intentionally just really helps to slow that process down. So the, the goal of preventative conservation, the goal of archival storage is to make things degrade as slowly as possible. Um, so next question, is LED lighting better or worse than incandescent or fluorescent lighting? So LED lighting, as far as I'm aware, is a little bit better. Um, it is slightly less damaging to materials over time. I would still say, uh, if, even if you have LED lighting in a room, having a nice archival box to keep your materials in where it's dark and dry and cool uh, is going to be the ideal spot for them. So I don't wanna say that like LED lighting is great and just have it on all the time, um, but LED lighting is, is maybe preferable to some of the other types of light. Uh, what about ultraviolet wands being advocated for COVID-19? Can these be used for bacteria and mold? I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. I haven't seen anybody trying to uh, use that application, um, but it sounds like maybe something to, to think about or look into. Um, Let's see. I have read that Scotch 811 tape might be used. It's low tack and acid free. Any thoughts? I'm not sure about Scotch 811 tape. There is a filmoplast tape, filmoplast P, and that is considered an acceptable archival uh, repair tape. I would still say that tape is not necessarily ideal. Um, but if you are using tape, if you need tape, you really want to look into what type of tape you're using. Um, like I said, I have not personally researched Scott 811, but Filmoplast is something that I do have on hand. And depending on the specific situation, sometimes it is uh, something that comes in handy. Are plastic totes suitable for long-term storage? So there are things to consider with plastic totes. If you have uh, live in a place that's fairly humid, I would say that plastic totes may not be the best option for you because if it gets moist in there, they're gonna trap it inside and you don't wanna make a little rainforest for your paper materials. If you live somewhere that's more dry, then plastic totes might be fairly good long-term storage. Um, I wouldn't just throw the materials directly into the plastic tote. I feel like if you put them into maybe some um, little envelopes or folders that are acid-free and then set them into the plastic tote, it would help kind of manage the, the humidity in there. And um, if there's any slight off gassing from the plastic, it would sort of help buffer them a little bit against that. Uh, like I said, sniff your totes, make sure they don't smell. That would be a sign that there's probably off gassing problems with them. How can we remove or lessen the acid level in paper products without damaging the paper? So deacidification is, I wouldn't say really like an at-home procedure. Um, again, I would say that rather than trying to change the acid level in the item itself, we try to put it in the least acidic, best sort storage situation that we can. So that that acidification, that acid breakdown will get much, much slower and really drawn out and that piece will last a lot longer. So your acid-free folder, your acid-free box or storage container, your nice temperature and humidity, consistent location, um, trying to keep it as cool and as, you know, 30 to 50% relative humidity as possible is going to be um, a way to really manage any acidity that's already in the paper. Uh, accordion plastic folders, if they say acid-free or something 
similar, can they be assured to be safe? I would say it's hard to say that any non-specifically archival item is assured to be safe. Um, and I don't know that you'll find plastic items generally labeled as acid-free. That's usually going to be more a label that's applied to papers or cardboards. Um, I would say, as with a plastic tub, if you want to use an accordion plastic folder, maybe have like a, an acid-free folder or enclosure envelope, you know, or an archival plastic uh, little holder. Um, you know, lots of people have their covers in, in little archival, archival, archival plastic sleeves so that the actual item is against the sleeve or the folder or the envelope rather than just up against the accordion. Uh, are there any known problems with conserving relatively recent documents? Um, I'm not sure if this is asking whether there are known problems that recent documents exhibit or whether there's special considerations for conserving them. Um, relatively recent documents. Um, so like computer printed maybe. Um, in a lot of cases, there isn't going to be the longevity to make uh, as good determinations about how those will last over time. Um, like I said, most paper that you're going to acquire now is often going to be acid free. So that helps a lot with long term uh, suitability. Uh, I think that the biggest problem that archivists deal with when it comes to recent documents is volume that now that we can print things, there's just so much stuff. So um, I would say when you're talking to an archivist about relatively recent materials, we're more trying to figure out like, how do we manage all of this and what do we keep and how can we like kind of cut it down in a way that isn't uh, destroying something important rather than um, being worried that we're like losing things. <laughs> so it's maybe an opposite problem in some ways. Uh, let's see. Can you talk about non-stick tape? Many stamp bookers swear by it. That makes me very uncomfortable. So non-stick tape, are you talking about like the uh, gecko tape that is, um, it's a special kind of tape that has like nanotechnology, little sort of uh, fibers on it that work like a gecko foot. Um, I have not seen anything about using that in paper-based applications. Everything I've seen about it, it looks like it's pretty intense. So um, again, that's not anything that I've worked with or tried, but if you have other questions about nonstick tape or want to provide more information, feel free to type something in there. So this is an interesting question. Are there commercial humidity and temperature storage facilities in major cities that can provide shared or rented spaces for preservation of philatelic documents? So there are certainly climate controlled storage facilities. You can get you know, a storage unit that's climate controlled. So let's say that you have a house that was built in the 1850s and it's you know, from an architectural standpoint, it's, it's been kept pretty true to, to the way it was formed. And because of that, your house um, has some pretty significant temperature and humidity swings and uh, maybe isn't the best place for documents to live. In that case, a, a climate controlled storage unit um, wouldn't necessarily be the worst idea for storing materials. You have to kind of weigh like, you know, how secure is the facility? Um, how closely is it monitored? You know, 
Are there people keeping an eye on it and making sure that the HVAC system is maintained properly and working properly at all times? But it's certainly something that you could consider if that seemed like a, a significantly better option than your own home. Um, is it best to store philatelic, philatelic materials in albums placed vertically on a bookshelf or horizontally? Um, I would say it depends. The risk with placing albums vertically is that if they're not packed in, you don't want them to be too tight. You don't want to be like crushing things. Um, but if they're too loose, they can start to sort of sag and bend. And if the interior pages are starting to get curved, then whatever they're holding is going to be curved. So uh, typically I would say that an album type item, I would lay flat, uh, but not stack too deep. Again, we don't wanna like be crushing things that are in them. So uh, that, that might depend a little bit on the album and how many of them you have and how how deep you'd be stacking them but i'd say in general my vote would be for horizontally uh, other than mylar what plastics are safe for preservation of documents so mylar is a brand name mylar is generally considered to be pretty safe but there are definitely uh, other plastics out there that what you're looking for um, is where's that question? What you're looking for is that the the listing for the plastic you're looking at. So you can find um, archival plastics on Amazon in different weights. And what you're looking for are words in the description like archival, um, long lasting. Um, polyethylene, polyester, the, the listing will generally want to tell you that this is an archival plastic. That's their selling point. So you want to be looking for those terms as you're trying to decide um, what you might want to purchase. Uh, do insecticides provide the potential for damaged documents? Any type of gas type thing um, could interact badly with paper. So um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend spraying insecticide in your philatelic storage room. Um, but let's say that you're having an exterminator kind of come and like do the line around the outside of your house. That is unlikely to uh, get to your, your philatelic stuff. And you know, having insecticide outside um, or in a different room. Again, you know, if it's gaseous, it's going to move different places. But having something that will kill insects in your house is probably better than having insects eat your materials. So sometimes kind of a a weighing game um, as to which is the lesser of two evils. Um, so how do you identify safe plastic storage materials that you already have from unsafe ones other than the plastic smell test? So um, if you have tubs already and they're uh, discoloring or getting kind of brittle, then they're probably not very good. But again, a lot of this goes back to storage environment. So if you have plastic tubs of materials and they're in your attic where it gets to be like 100 degrees and then like 30 degrees and it's hot and humid and any sort of plastic is going to have a hard time withstanding that and is going to start to degrade and in the process of degrading it'll be releasing stuff that we don't want. Um, if your plastic storage tubs don't smell funky and you keep them in the people part of the house, maybe in a nice cool and dark and dry closet or room uh, on your first floor where they're unlikely to have any like 
water leak through the roof or anything like that, um, they're probably fine. You know, I don't want people to think that you have to tie yourself in knots in order to store materials. A lot of this is fairly practical. Um, you know, would I feel good in this space? Why not? Well, because it's 90 degrees, no, my paper probably isn't gonna like that either. So kind of keep those things in mind. You want it to be cool, you want it to be dark, you want it to be dry, uh, and you want things to be acid-free as much as possible. And again, um, you can always use those acid-free folders or envelopes to help uh, provide a layer of buffer between your stuff that you wanna keep and whatever it happens to be inside of. Right, we're gonna have one uh, more question, time? Jasmine. Oh, are we, we're at 7.30, yes. So I'm sorry, Heidi, I didn't catch what you said. Can you repeat that? No, that's fine. I said, let's go, well, this will unfortunately, regrettably be the last question, so. Okay. Um, so first one I see, what types of photography are dangerous for philatelic materials? Um, so I, I don't wanna mislead anybody. Uh, photography, I wouldn't say is, is any danger to philatelic materials. Photography, photographs simply require um, more stringent handling and environmental storage conditions than philatelic materials do. They're just more delicate and sensitive. So, um, you know, your, your, if your philatelic materials were stored in the same environment as your photographic materials, they'd probably be quite happy there because your photographic materials actually want a little bit lower humidity and they're more temperature sensitive than paper and also uh, more sensitive to light. And um, so if, if photographs are happy, then philatelic materials will probably be very happy in an environment. All right, so that's our last question. Um, Much to the chagrin of all those on board, However, Thanks for asking great questions, everyone. Um, you know, there were so many that, that I could not answer all of them, even if I went speed answer. Um, but I'm, I'm glad everyone joined us tonight. Thanks for being here. Uh, it, was, it was great to talk to everybody about this. Um, you know, as an archivist, I could talk about storage longer than anyone wants to listen. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys were interested. Absolutely, this was, this was a fine, fine stamp chat and I really look forward to having you on again in future. A um, lot of great questions, friends. Remember that this will is being recorded and will appear on the APS YouTube channel. So be sure to sub like and subscribe to the APS YouTube channel while you're there. Uh, you'll probably wanna bookmark this chat and please share it with your clubs and any other friends that you know that would enjoy this sort of chat, like uh, Jasmine and I were speaking, this isn't, these are practical tips, not just for philatelists, but for people um, who have a penchant for archiving. Great presentation, Jasmine, so practical, so relevant and uh, great resources, incredible. Thank you so much. And I do wanna say congratulations again to you and Mr. Bill Schultz, for your Large Vermeil Award uh, for their website on the scarce postal rate of the six and a quarter cents. It was a fantastic presentation. They're making the circuit around the, the nation and uh, we have it on our classroom C3A at stamps.org. For more stamp chats, visit and subscribe to the APS YouTube channel where you'll find philatelic presentations from scholars, authors, artists, historians, and fellow collectors. Use the comment box below to keep the conversation rolling. Until next time, collect and connect. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on stamps.org. You'll want to bookmark that to stay updated on the next Stamp Chats, the American Philatelic Society, social since 1886. Thanks again so much, Jasmine. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us.